Hey there. So here we are at the last of the chapter three vodcasts. In this one, we're going to spend some time talking about the final two types of major biomolecules, proteins and nucleic acids. So jumping right into things, uh, we've already talked about lipids and carbohydrates and uh, remembering the six main elements that make up living things. Proteins contain five of the six, and the only one that they are missing is phosphorus. So you're going to find uh, the five of the six most abundant elements there. The monomers for proteins are amino acids. There are 20 of them, and they link together to create uh, the polymers that make up the over 100,000 proteins that we have in our body, as well as all of the proteins found in living things. An amino acid has a real pretty standard structure to it. Um, it has an amine group, um, which is your NH2 group over here. It has a carboxyl group, which makes it acidic, hence the amino acid. And then it has an R group, which is this variable that we have talked about in class. Uh, a couple of examples of amino acids just so you can see how the variation of that R group is, um, but at the same time see that it has those very consistent pieces with the functional groups, having the amine group, having the carboxyl group, and then you can see um, here we just have five of the 20 examples. We are going to spend a lot of time with these once we get to molecular genetics when we find out exactly um, how a gene codes for a specific protein order. So when we create an amino acid, or create an amino acid chain, I should say, and these amino acids are linked together, they form a very specific type of covalent bond that we have mentioned called a peptide bond. This bond is specifically between the carbon of one amino acid and the nitrogen of the other. So this car, um, covalent bond that forms is called a peptide bond. So here is an example. You'll find one of these as well in chapter three of your textbook. And it just shows the condensation reaction that occurs when we link two amino acids together. You can see the removal of the water. You lose two hydrogens off of the amine group. You lose the oxygen off of the carboxyl group. And then you get the combination of the peptide bond there between the two. Now proteins are built in a way where we can look at their different levels of how they're structured. If you remember earlier on, when we mentioned the importance of shape, well, shape is absolutely important with proteins. Proteins are totally um, wrapped around the shape that they are. Their function is built on this. Shape, 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 that magic word. <laughs> We're gonna hear it over and over again. And we can talk about protein shape by breaking it down into various levels. We have first the primary protein structure. This is literally the amino acid sequence. What amino acid is hooked to what? And it can be any order, any number. Um, there are proteins as little as three amino acids long, and there are proteins that are as big as thousands of amino acids long. So it's just gonna vary. But that's the primary structure, so what is the actual sequence of those amino acids? So there you have an example. So all of these amino acids bonded together, we call that a polypeptide chain. Again, poly meaning many. The three-dimensional um, structure, and again, that whole shape, so the 3D shape, is influenced by the sequence. The way that that chain is going to fold, it's going to move, is going to be based on whatever sequence the amino acids is. And this is a whole field. They are trying to figure out protein folding um, all the time. And it is a very, very tricky, very interesting process as they try to work out what those are. Secondary protein structure is where we take that amino acid chain and it's going to begin to fold and twist. And it folds in basically two types of ways. You're either going to get um, what we call an alpha, basically an alpha helix, a twist, or a beta sheet. Okay. And, and this is where that amino acid is going to fold, it's going to twist, and it's going to form hydrogen bonds basically every two to three that are going to hold it together. And these patterns, you get that coil or that pleat. Okay, so for that one, that's where we're going to get what we call the alpha helix. And helix just means twist, and the pleat means beta sheet. And it's literally that. It's either going to be a twist or it's going to be kind of pleated. So pretty straightforward. And there we have it, which I just wrote over, okay? But you also have this picture right in your textbook as well. 
third level protein structure is where we're going to take these alpha helices, these beta sheets, and we're going to coil them totally up around themselves. So the folds are going to fold. And in this particular type of structure, where it's going to be held together um, by both hydrogen bonds as well as what we call disulfide bridges. And it's going to be a link between sulfur atoms that are found between adjacent amino acids. So those R groups that make up that uniqueness of each amino acid hold together through hydrogen bonding. And again, as well as we're going to see the sulfur atoms of some of those R groups. And what's funny is you don't find sulfur in every amino acid. It's only found in a few, and those create those disulfide bridges. So di means two. So it's going to be a covalent bond that's held between two sulfur atoms. And here we have it, some examples there as well. So again, don't stress out about this picture. It is in your textbook. And lastly, we have what we call the quaternary protein structure. And this is where we're going to take two separate amino acid chains and actually link them together. So what wasn't what, you know, was one total chain is going to be put together into a functioning protein itself. So multiple chains will interact to form the actual final actual protein. We don't call it a protein until we hit that final structure. You know, example could be here, okay, where you're going to see um, basically these two pieces are interacting together. A great example is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is set up by two chains, um, two different polypeptide chains. These are also maintained through hydrogen bonds and disulfide bridges. So again, very specific um, hierarchy on how a protein folds and creates that very specific, very important three-dimensional shape that's going to be so vital to its function. All right, so what do proteins do? <laughs> besides everything. They, they are enormously important for structure. Uh, they're embedded in the, basically the lipid bilayer of a cell membrane. So your cell membrane isn't just that, that layer. It's going to be totally stippled and embedded with all of these proteins that have an enormous amount of functions, even just within the membrane itself. They act as receptors, they act as channels, um, they act as communicators. So lots of different pieces. They're going to provide support and rigidity. So again, that structural piece. They're an energy source. We can use proteins as an energy source. It's not the first line of energy, but proteins can enter into um, our metabolism chain of how we get energy at distinctive points. Enzymes, okay, big deal here. You guys have already heard about enzymes, and I'm sure you guys are totally wondering what the heck these things are. And we've mentioned them, that they are the structures that are important for making reactions happen inside living things. And we are going to get to these, we are going to spend a lot of time with them, and every single reaction that goes on inside us and inside living things is pretty much enzymated. So if we didn't have these, wouldn't be so good. And in some cases, proteins are going to have oligosaccharides or fatty acids even attached to them. And with this comes the ability to sort of be like a, um, almost like an antenna. So on the surface of a cell membrane, you might get an oligosaccharide that's attached to a protein that's going to actually allow a cell to recognize another cell. Something that's kind of cool, if you want to talk about um, protein complexity here. Um, this is really kind of new stuff, which is, you know, make it pretty neat. It's what we call heat shock proteins. And these proteins are um, basically there um, to take and help a protein that might have lost its three-dimensional shape. They act as what we call chaperones. And so you got proteins helping proteins shape themselves correctly. So it's kind of a neat um, piece of the puzzle in understanding um, how proteins fold. Again, this whole realm of science right now is understanding, now that we know the blueprint pretty well and we can understand the genome pretty well, the next level is really trying to understand how proteins are made and not only that, how they get their shape because the rules aren't really that obvious. So with heat shock proteins, they come in, help the chain fold correctly and then actually surround it and basically let the protein come in, envelop it around like this, protect it from other parts of the cell while it's being folded, 
and then release it out, which is really kind of cool. So it kind of acts as the shrimp, you know. So again, it's protein helping protein. Makes you wonder. Uh, this is something that came a few years ago um, out of Scientific American. All right, here is that very textbook example of hemoglobin, and we'll mention this a couple of times. Hemoglobin is a very important protein. It is responsible for binding oxygen. So this binds O2 in our blood. Big deal. Very, very important. And where it binds is actually four locations, so every single hemoglobin molecule can bind to up to four oxygens, and our red blood cells are just jam-packed with this stuff. And we'll talk about hemoglobin a little while later. So when we have changes to protein structure, this is the biggie. So what happens if you change the shape? What happens if, you know, you don't have the structure you're supposed to have? Well, we give it a word, and this is a word you're going to need to know. We're going to talk about it pretty often. Uh, it's called denaturation, or when a protein denatures. One of my biggest pet peeves is when students say, oh, that protein was killed. Well, no, proteins aren't alive, so we can't say that they've been killed, but we can denature them, and that really is when the three-dimensional structure is so destroyed that it no longer retains that shape, it no longer can function the way that it's supposed to. And we can do this at all the different levels of protein structure. We can do it at the amino acid sequence, which is your primary structure. Okay, so we can literally alter the change okay, and go from one amino acid structure right here and change this to that. Okay, so that would be an alteration. Sometimes, usually the reason for this would have been a mutation. And here's the example. And the specific example is the cause for what we know as sickled cell anemia. Here is what your normal red blood cell looks like, very round, kind of donut-y shape because there's this indentation in the center. And again, jam-packed full of hemoglobin, giving it its red color. When the hemoglobin protein isn't shaped correctly, um, it causes the red blood cell to squash and it squashes and gets really, really sticky. And so as it goes through a capillary and squashes really flat, it can't pop back open and retains this sort of very sickly, odd looking shape there. And that is the result of one singular amino acid difference, not the loss of an amino acid, just the change in one amino acid. So if we change the shape, we change or lose the function, okay? Say that to yourself a hundred times. Change the protein shape, you change the function. And this is gonna be critical, especially when you're talking about enzyme function. So lastly, nucleic acids. Last group, real short and sweet. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here because when we get to DNA and we get into genetics later on in the year, we are going to spend tons of time here. Nucleic acids are the final group. Uh, they are a pretty important group, um, and <laughs> pretty important. Uh, they also contain five of the six most abundant elements. Um, different from protein, they don't contain sulfur, but they do contain phosphorus. So there's the big difference if you're going to look elementally at um, a protein versus a nucleic acid, that's what you're going to find. Monomer is a nucleotide. Monomer is a nucleotide, and that's made up of three things. It's made up of a sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. There's your two sugar possibilities, your base unit, and a phosphate group. Okay, those are the three main components that make up a single nucleotide. Again, we're going to be learning this a ton in a few months. Here's an example. Um, in this case, you've got your, your phosphates. Um, and this is actually one derivative of a nucleic acid. This is known as ATP. This is our energy currency. And we are going to love ATP. There's your three phosphates right there. High energy containing molecule. So of course, ATP. We're going to be coming to that. That's the whole point of cellular respiration is to build up tons of ATP. Coenzymes um, are some of the examples as well. They're going to be responsible for helping out uh, during electron transfer for things like cell respiration, photosynthesis, a cyclic AMP. That's going to come along when we um, basically talk about hormones and hormone transport and me uh, chemical message signaling. And of course, the biggies, DNA and RNA. Those are really the two most important nucleic acids that we have, and we're going to spend oh so much time 